It's a very interesting, um, just a, second, a very interesting comment on um, um, working from the problem as opposed to necessarily the institution set. Um, just on the UN Security Council, um, yeah, I think it's, you know, in some ways it's planned and designed to be frustrating, obviously, because of the, the veto um, power that's, that's within it. One of the questions that I have is whether or not, um, you know, although I spoke of a growing disconnect between sort of global power uh, arrangements, a global power distribution of power, and the actual permanent membership of the UN Security Council. It's it's unclear to me that it's yet facing a legitimacy crisis, and there's also a question of whether or not any alternative um, mechanism, uh, given the questions of efficiency or effectiveness, um, when any enlargement would actually be any better at doing what the Security Council is supposed to do, which is um, um, to defend international peace and security, you can make the argument that um, uh, it would create lots of gridlock and uh, make it much harder to get sort of winning coalitions or blocking coalitions. On the other hand, you could make the argument that, well, if you got a few more capable countries there, they would they might actually invest in it. Um, but it would very much depend on the identity of those countries, <laughs> to say the least, and how big any enlargement would be. But um, go ahead, please. Yeah, uh, just one word, and it will be very short concerning the the problem set by the implementation of the measures. Uh, just to take an example, uh, finance one. You know, I don't speak about corruption or the, I should say, uh, uh, <coughs> illegal and fraudulent banking, but just a normal operation in banking operation. Everybody knows, you know, after the, the problem set uh, appeared in uh, 2007 and so the explosion, explosion in 2008, uh, it was decided to try to not to see that again. And in, uh, in Basel, there was a Basel III recommendation, which were, uh, I should say, discuss, discussed at length by everybody. And we, uh, they came back with, uh, I should say, some recommendation. The first thing, once the recommendation of, from Basel III uh, appeared, I should say, uh, publicly, the first thing that the United States said that they will not implement them. Then the Latin American people say, me, are you crazy? Never will do that. The same for the Chinese. So now, you know, the only people who will apply and who will implement these recommendations, which are pure, I should say, common sense, will be the European banks, and maybe the Japanese bank, full stop. I think that here there is a real problem of leadership. And I cannot understand that a country like the United States refused to implement the Basel III recommendation. By the way, they don't even implement the Basel II. I cannot understand that China, who has some, you say, ambition decide not even to read them. And by, you know, I think that we have to keep that in mind and to, to say it, at least. That's all. I, I just want to clarify my general perspective on this. I think the glass is more than half full. I do not think that the glass is more than half empty. I think that, as I tried to say earlier, one of the consequences of globalization has been dragging something between one and a half to two billion people out of abject poverty. One of the things that we have created is we have built stocks of financial and technological capital of an absolutely unprecedented scale on the global level. There is no shadow of a doubt that if you take any measure of welfare that you can dream up, that humanity in the aggregate has never had a higher percentage of people who are at higher levels of, let's take the UNDP's Human Development Index as an example, at, at higher levels of welfare and overall performance than today. 
So it would be completely mad to look back over the last 30 or 40 years and say, oh my God, it's been an unmitigated disaster. In many ways, it's been an extraordinary success. But what you've got to understand about complex systems is that the level of connectivity that you engender in the system when things are going well on the way up, take the period between 2003 and 2007, the performance, the growth in respect to the financial sector on a, on a global scale was phenomenal. Enormous amounts of wealth were created in the financial sector over that particular period with positive knock-on effects in respect of the real sector. But with the same level of connectivity, by God, when it starts going down, then, of course, you get the multipliers and you get the amplification effects on the way down at the same time. So we must understand the implication, the level of complexity and connectivity that we have engendered in a global system. And we must have more respect for the fact that we don't really understand how it works. No banker, no banker, no one sitting on a bank board understood what was happening in terms of the playoff between CDOs, CDO squared, CDO cubed, and CDSs, and I'm not even getting into the rest of the space. It was impossible to model it. John Tain is on record as saying that it used to take them more than three hours using what he described as one of the fastest computers in the United States to model the effect of a single tranche of a single CDO on their balance sheet. So we've, just, we, we, we've got to be respectful of the level of complexity. Bruno runs a brilliantly successful business, and I'm going to say something that you can shoot down with the greatest of pleasure. But you run that business successfully because you've got a clear sense of vision in respect of where you want to take it. You've got absolute clarity in respect of your mission. You've got time-bound quantified goals which you adapt from time to time, and you've got effective strategies in place to be able to deliver on it. As a consequence of that, you know what level of internal socialization, integration, and all of the rest of it you have to bring about when you integrate a new company. You know what level of cross-cultural communication you have to engage in, and you're capable of applying that effectively on a consistent basis. If we ran the world like you run your company, it would work. But that's not how we run the world. We don't run the world anything like that. We do not have a collective vision that is shared among all of the major actors on a global scale. We do not have a clear sense of mission. We do not have time-bound quantified goals. And we do not have coherent strategies. And we don't share a common normative framework that allows us to be able to say, wait a minute, you're out of line there, and come on, guys, get back on the, you know. We don't have any of those instruments in place. So as a consequence of that, we run into problems all the time. You'd run into problems if you had those problems in your business. There's nothing extraordinary about it. It's the way human organization works. You need to have that level of coherence. Why was Singapore so extraordinarily successful in the period in which its destiny was defined? Because you had all of those things. A lot of it happened to come from one chap, which is probably not desirable, but the fact of the matter is you had all of that for a significant period of time. Political systems work on that basis. If you do not have high degrees of normative coherence in a political system, you cannot decide how to trade off conflicting interests. You cannot get people to accept the legitimacy of the decisions that are made by the executive. You can't inform, inform intelligently the actions of the legislature in creating laws. And the courts wouldn't know what to do in adjudicating them. It's all premised on a high degree of normative coherence. And we haven't done that. The other problem that we've got, and you've all referred to it, is the fact that we all think in disciplinary silos. People are trained as economists, or they're trained as lawyers, or they're trained as political scientists, or they're trained as sociologists, or they're trained as cultural anthropologists, or as engineers, or as whatever else. But that's not the way we have to deal with problems. The problems we have to deal with today is how we're going to get growth 
back that is both socially inclusive and environmentally sustainable? And no economist can answer that question. No earth scientist can answer that question. No lawyer can answer that question. No political leader can answer that question. But that's what we have to address in that particular space. If we're thinking about security, we have to think about how we reconceptualize security from the level of human security through national security, through regional security to global security. Because at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is make life secure for individuals and, and, and communities. But we don't have a mechanism for doing that because the people who are worried about human security are completely different. They're not in the Pentagon and the, and the agency. So we've got two big problems here. We haven't got an organizational framework underpinned by a common normative consensus. And we have habits that are the product of Western learning from Plato onwards with its high point probably in the late 18th and 19th centuries in respect of disciplinary specialization. That's not much use in terms of policy in today's highly complex circumstances. It's a real problem. And that's why I think, despite the fact that we have done an enormous number of things absolutely extraordinarily well, you're dead right. You need fit for purpose solutions. You don't want to go and create something that is unrelated to the problems that you're trying to solve or the challenges that you're trying to meet. But you also don't want to be locked into an industrial manufacturing process which worked extremely well in the 1950s, but which bears no relationship to what is happening in respect of technological change and social aspirations in the period between 2011 and 2020. And that's the challenge of global governance, I think. At the heart of it, that's the challenge. How do we get into that particular space? And that means changing the way we think about it, working much harder to get a significant degree of normative coherence in the same way that anyone would if they were trying to run a, com a company, and trying to overcome this degradation of authority, which has effectively destroyed the democratic political process over the course of the last five years or so. The simple truth is that people who get elected on the national level today are incapable of making a significant difference in the context of a highly globalized world. It's a huge problem. I'm not saying it to be nasty about it. I'm really worried about it. I have no idea how one grapples with that problem. But these are the challenges that we have to get our heads around. Did you, did you want to uh, add any final comments? No, no, I, I like the, the former comments. Well, um, uh, thank you all for surviving these two hours and for also for your um, very intelligent um, uh, contributions to um, what is a uh, discussion that will be very easy to summarize uh, for tomorrow's <laughs> report back in the plenary session.